Hi, I'm Nick Thorne and I'm a regular writer for Discover Your Ancestors magazine and I run the Family History Researcher Academy course at familyhistoryresearcher.com. Today I'm going to be looking at some wonderfully detailed RAF records. These are from the Air 27 records from the National Archives and are a rich source of information for those who have ancestors that served in the Air Force. The genealogist has the full collection of images of the actual books and they are now live and fully transcribed. Um, now what is so great about these records? Well, they're a set of daily journal entries for Air Force units as they carried out their role in War and Peace. It's always fascinating to be able to find some records that reveal the lives of our ancestors so if you've got some ancestors who served in the Royal Air Force or some of the Dominion Air Forces and Allied Air Forces that came under British command, then these RAF Operation Record books are going to be a fabulous uh, source of information for you. Now, sometimes they are abbreviated to be called ORBs, uh, standing for Operation it's Operations Record books. You'll find that inside these uh, records you, that, that they contain diary entries that often mention Air Force personnel by name. And for that reason they can provide us with a fantastic insight into our Air Force ancestors and so help us enormously in our research. These journal type entries that make up uh, part of these records reveal details not only about the operations that the servicemen were undertaking but also some notes on everyday happenings that go to humanize the uh, the story of an ancestor service uh, in the air force the Air 27 records really do allow us a fascinating insight into a number of wartime RAF units because they provide summaries of events and they can reveal the deaths of aviators, some of the less serious crashes, as well as um, less disquieting details such as the weather and the places patrolled by the planes that your ancestors may have flown. As I've said, personnel are very often named in these reports, and that's really great for a researcher who wants to follow where an aircrew ancestor has been posted or what may have happened to them. You can find aircrew duties recorded in many of these documents, and they reveal such assignments uh, that the men went on, such as uh, bombing, convoy escort, submarine hunt, attacking docks and shipping, and dive bombing raids. That's just naming a few. The information could be really useful in understanding some of the missions that your family member was tasked with undertaking. And this can be really helpful, especially when so many of our past uh, family who served in the war revealed very little about their wartime experiences. Right, so let's uh, look at a particular period that ran from the 10th of July 1940 to the 31st of October 1940. Uh, that's the period known as the Battle of Britain. So the country had yet to be joined in the fight by the United States and the name uh, Battle Britain came from a speech given by the Prime Minister, Winston Churchill, to the House of Commons on the 18th of June, 1940. Uh, at that time, he said what General Vagon called the Battle of France is over. The Battle of Britain is about to begin. Now, Churchill is also credited with another phrase that's associated forever with the fight to hold back. The, the Nazi enemy. And he said, never in the field of human conflict was so much owed by so many to so few. 
Now, the wartime Prime Minister was alluding to Shakespeare's famous speech in his play, Henry V, when he says, we few, we happy few, we band of brothers. But the few is now immediately recognised in Britain as referring to the almost 3,000 young men who more than 80 years ago strapped themselves into their Spitfires and their Hurricane fighter aircraft and flew up into the sky to, to fight and hold off the Nazi peril as Hitler's Luftwaffe planes tried to knock out Britain's air defences. So let's look for a pilot who was one of the few, Archie McKellar. Now, if we do a search for McKellar in the orbs for June 1940, we discover him in the 602 City of Glasgow squadron, where he's flying Spitfires, and he's a flying officer. He's based in Drem in East Lothian, Scotland. On the 21st of June, however, he'd be promoted to flight lieutenant, and he'd then be transferred off to 605 squadron. And that was a unit which was equipped with the other famous Battle of Britain aircraft, the Hawker Hurricane. Let's look at uh, the orb and glancing at the other entries on that page, um, which is for the month before the conflict over British airspace was to begin. And we read that the station dance band played at B flight dispersal point for an hour and a half. We also see that a flying officer, A.M. Grant, got engaged, and this was noted in the orb. The weather was put down as tropical on that particular day, which is interesting for Scotland. And we also see that a mobile cooker was sent to MacMerry, which does sort of raise the question as to how they'd been cooking in that East Lothian village before they received their mobile cooker. It's also noted that the sleeping quarters were being made comfortable and the Spitfires had their underneath repainted in duck egg blue to camouflage them better in the sky. Another entry tells of flap reports that had been coming in about parachutists landing in outlying districts, none of which turned out to be true the writer of the orb notes. But more chillingly are the comments for the 12th of June 1940, when it says, news from France very grave, Jerry tanks within 15 miles of Paris. And then on the 14th, we see Paris occupied by the Germans. And on the 22nd of June, France signed an armistice with Germany. So at that point, it must have been very obvious to these men that the fight would now be concentrated in the skies above Britain. They'd been fighting back raids across north of England, but soon they're going to be posted down to the south to defend the United Kingdom from the German enemy that was just over the Channel. On the 10th of July, action began, but it wasn't until the 11th that the reports started coming in. So if we take a look at the orb, we see the report for the 11th of July, 1940 for this squadron. And in uh, the words that they've written the day after the Battle of Britain has begun, and, and this is the squadron to which Archie McKellar had recently joined. So they report that the weather had turned wintry, cold, damp and continual rain. And only a Lynx trainer was able to fly. The 10th, however, which was the day that the Battle of Britain began, had seen much more action, as can be seen in the reported successes and losses for the day before. It says 14 aircraft knocked down and 23 severely damaged off southeast coast yesterday at a cost of two fighters and one pilot missing. Now, Archie McKellar was one of an even smaller group than the few. He was one of a handful 
that had become an ace in a day. McKellar would rise to lead his new squadron and become a fighter ace. That's a pilot who has five victories or more accredited to them. McKellar, however, along with fellow Brits Ronald Hamlin, New Zealander Brian Carberry, and the Pole Anthony Glavaski, had the unusual distinction of being more than just an ace. These four men had the distinction of achieving the unusual tally of five victories in the space of just one day, and that in, earned them the informal designation of an ace in a day. In Archie McKellar's case, that was on the 7th of October 1940, and the orb for his squadron noted this success without going into details. The orb had been compiled at the base that he was serving at, which was in Croydon, and it began saying it was a very fine day. Three patrols were made. 605 Squadron's Hurricanes encountered Messerschmitts over London in the first patrol, and Archie McKellar, by now a squadron leader, damaged one enemy plane in the sortie. But there was more success to come. The orb tells us that the second patrol was at 1500 hours and was remarkable for the success of squadron leader McKellar. So the squadron had come across 15 ME 109s with another 40 to 50 of these aircraft above and behind. The pilots of 605 squadron dived down on the 15 Messerschmitts and then a few of the German planes from the larger formation above them then dived down on the British in turn. A dogfight ensued over Kent and during this aerial combat Archie McKellar shot down four ME 109s. A later patrol near Biggin Hill saw the pilots of 605 encounter four more ME 109s of which squadron leader McKellar destroyed one and that made his fifth victory in a day. So in classic understatement the orb only refers to his next patrol as being remarkable for the success of squadron leader McKellar. But Archie McKellar had just become an ace in a day. Now here's a fact. The Battle of Britain, the RAF has always maintained, was fought between the 10th of July and the 31st of October 1940. So on that basis McKellar was a survivor of the action having notched up 21 aircraft shot down, his Hurricane P3308 also held the top score for the highest number of kills during the Battle of Britain. Sadly, however, the very next day after the Battle of Britain ended, squadron leader Archie McKellar became one of the pilots who paid the ultimate sacrifice. Now, he was flying, uh, as we can tell from reading the orb record on the genealogist, another hurricane designated V6878. As his demise was outside of the dates recognised for the Battle of Britain by one day, he is not one of the pilots commemorated on the Battle of Britain Roll of Honour in Westminster Abbey. However, the Secretary of State for Air, Sir Archibald Sinclair, visited Glasgow, his hometown, on the 16th of January 1941 to deliver a eulogy to the former fighter pilot. And that's a fitting honour for one of the few who lost his life just a day out of the Battle of Britain's dates. Now, if we look at the orb for the 1st of November 1940, we see... Uh, McKellar's time up was 0740, but there's no time down. There's just a dash in its place. And there's a simple note, aircraft crashed. By the 1st of November 1940, McKellar had recorded 21 victories. And not only were all but two of these claimed within the last two and a half months of his life, 
but ipso facto, they would join the Battle of Britain. His last flight is recorded in another page of the orb for the squadron on that day. He went on patrol near Faversham in Kent, and the orb says, flying into the sun at 25,000 feet. They came across 12 enemy planes flying northwest. Now, the pilots of 605 Squadron turned and dived on the German planes. And in the words of the person who wrote the orb, a most successful encounter ensued. But it was the opening remarks of the day's report that speaks volume about how squadron leader McKellar was thought of by his comrades. We read, A sad day for the squadron, as squadron leader McKellar was killed during the morning patrol. His charming personality, his generosity, his wit and vivaciousness will be missed not only by the squadron, but by all whom he came into contact. Now, if we then move on to read the entry for the 6th of November 1940 in the orbs for the 605 Squadron, we see that the writer saw fit to record that the funeral of their recent commander took place in Glasgow that day. In restrained words, it mentions that owing to an unfortunate understanding an aircraft being sent to take two members of the squadron to represent 605 at squadron leader McKellar's funeral never arrived until too late in Croydon. The orb sim simply then states, this was most disappointing. We can only imagine the actual language that was probably used on that Croydon aerodrome that day. On the 8th of November 1940, squadron leader McKellar's actions brought a final award in the form of a posthumous Distinguished Service Order, a DSO, and further recognition came to McKellar in a mention in dispatches that was gazetteered in the Gazette on the 31st of December 1940. He is... Uh, and always will be a remarkable warrior in the air defence of Britain. When we think of World War II British pilots, there's one who comes to most people's mind, and that's double amputee Douglas Bader. Now, we're able to find this famous air race from before the war, as he's posted from RAF Kenley to RAF Uxbridge in December 1931. The compiler of the orb reports that pilot officer D.R.S. Bader was supernumerary, non-effective, sick as a result of flying accident at Woodley Aerodrome on the 14th of December 1931. So he's sick? Not exactly. Although the report does not elaborate, that was the date of the crash that saw Bader lose both his legs as he was attempting some aerobatics. However, he recovered from his accident and Bader retook his flight training and passed. And he went on to take part in the 1932 Hendon Air Show in a Gloucester Gamecock and there's a photograph that shows him in front of the aircraft while training for this event. The RAF, however, then retired him against his wishes in May 1933. The grounds for this were that his situation was not covered by King's regulations. Now, with the outbreak of war, however, Bader was able to rejoin the RAF in 1939 and as you'd expect there are a number of mentions of this famous fighter pilot in the orbs uh, as he returned to flying duties when war broke out. So if you're following the path of an airman ancestor via these orb documents you'll often be able to see when they were awarded a medal or posted to a new unit. Of the 
several mentions of Douglas Bader in the orbs for 242 Squadron in the Second World War. There is one on the 14th of September 1940 when tagged onto the day's entry he gets a mention. So the orb has reported that the wing was on patrol over London and it said nothing seen but jolly cold. It reports that a pilot crashed because of an unknown oxygen problem and the unit's second patrol of the day was off Kent and they said still no enemy aircraft seen. But then we can read that squadron leader Bader was awarded the DSO and a colleague, Flight Lieutenant Ball, the DFC. Now, these records also highlight some entries that are um, a little bit lighter. So I'm going to call this section parties and a wry sense of humour. So while many of the entries in the orb suggest an accurate and formal record of operations carried out by a squadron, such as the action in the air, the practice runs, the day-to-day -day duties, some reports do show various lighter moments. If we look for a good example, that's number three squadron in August 1945. Uh, so if VE Day had occurred three months earlier and the squadron were by that time based in Germany. Uh, we can read about their sorties and on the 4th of August we read that a terrific party was laid on by 39 brackets R wing to celebrate the wing disbanding. It was well patronised. Several nurses and ENSA girls turned up. The next day, the entry was very brief, limited to just three words. No flying today. We may conclude that that was probably a most wise thing after the party the day before. On the 8th of the month, that squadron then moved to the northern German city of Lübeck to join 124 Wing under the command of the famous ace, Group Captain Johnny Johnson, DSO, DFC. And that moment is recorded in the orb of the day, with the compiler of the diary injecting some wry humour into the official account of his squadron. He writes, At the crack of dawn, well, at 10am anyway, the squadron left 39 brackets R wing for 124 wing at Lübeck. Uh, now let's turn our attention towards Bomber Command, because while fighter pilots often get the glory in so many of the reports we, we read in the history of uh, the Second World War, we are able to find in these orb records uh, notes about the airmen who served in RAF's Bomber Command. Bomber units played a central role in the strategic bombing of Germany in World War II, and they included crew from the Commonwealth and other allied countries, as well as those from Britain. The ages of the air crew who went up on the raids were mostly between 19 and 25 years old. Though some were known to be as young as 16, and at least one man was in his 60s. Bomber Command air crews suffered a high casualty rate, with 46% death rate, 57,205 men were killed. A further 8,403 were wounded in action, while 9,838 became prisoners of war. Despite this, some experienced airmen carried out repeat operations at their own request and several are recorded to have flown between 100 and 120 operations. One of these brave men was squadron leader Danny Everett, or more properly, 
squadron leader Daniel, Trevor, Bulmer, Everett, DFC and two bars. And he's believed to have flown more than 120 operations before being killed in action on the 7th of March 1945. The operations record book for that day uh, for number 35 squadron records that his aircraft is missing, nothing being heard from it after takeoff. These simple and unemotional words chronicle the failure to return of a pilot and seven other members of his crew whose luck had finally run out. Everett had uh, originally enlisted in the Royal Air Force Volunteer Reserve in around May 1940. He became a sergeant pilot and by July 1942 he joined the Heavy Bombers. He was then commissioned as a pilot officer on the 29th of May 1943 and then joined Number 35 Squadron RAF Pathfinder Force at RAF Gravely. Now, Pathfinders were a group of highly experienced squadron and flight commanders supported by several highly experienced pilots, navigators and bomb aimers. The Pathfinders aimed to improve the accuracy of bombing by flying a little ahead of the main force and dropping marker flares, known as target indicators, directly onto the target. And these were used as an aiming point by the lesser experienced crews who were following behind them. Now if we look at Wikipedia's entry for Daniel Everett, it explains that he was ordered to take a rest from operations, but he continued to look for opportunities to fly. And on the 7th of March 1945, he gathered together a scratch crew of senior airmen for a spare Avro Lancaster aircraft, serial number ME361, and he led 256 Halifaxes and 25 other Lancasters of numbers 4, 6 and 8 groups on an attack of an oil refinery at Hemingstead. Everett took off at 18.53 hours and he was a master bomber in this attack. His aircraft was shot down, however, about... 2,200 hours in the target area, apparently having been hit by flak. Everett and his entire crew of eight, well, seven plus him, were killed and they were buried by the Germans at, uh, in the area of Hemingstedt. But they were later moved to the Commonwealth War Grave Commission's War Cemetery at Hamburg. Now, here is a slightly unusual example from the Air 27 records. Also included in this set of orbs are some poignant press cuttings that have been pasted in. And this particular one reveals the posthumous award in 1945 of a Victoria Cross to a flight sergeant, George Thompson, who before the war had been a quiet grocer's boy from Kinross. His Lancaster was on fire, and while he was in terrible pain from burns, he carried two of his helpless comrades through the flames. Thompson was a brave wireless operator in the Lancaster, and sadly, however, he died from the injuries that he received in that rescue. Not immediately, but he endured three weeks of suffering. Now, let's look for another pilot who in later life became famous. It can often be a bit of a surprise to discover that famous people, as well as our own family members, did extraordinary things in the Second World War. And some of them may have told their stories, whereas others remained frustratingly silent. With the release of these orbs, it's fascinating to now find their names recorded and so add some details to their family story. But here is the tale of a painful entry into his squadron for someone who would be, go on to become a famous children's author. Rule Dull. 
Dahl served as a pilot in the RAF, and some of us may have read the second part of his autobiography, which is called Going Solo. Now, in 1939, when the war was coming, Dahl joined up, and his book tells its readers that he took part in a number of very significant missions, such as the war in North Africa, where he crash-landed and he was blinded by this crash for a number of days. And then he fought in the air over Greece. Well, a search for Roald Dahl in the Air 27 orb records uh, introduces the researcher to him arriving at his new squadron on the 20th of September 1940. The report spells out that Pilot Officer Dahl made a dramatic entrance to his posting to number 80 squadron based at the time in Egypt. So looking at the orb, it says Pilot Officer Dahl was ferrying an aircraft from number 102 MU to this unit, but unfortunately not being used to flying aircraft over the desert. He made a forced landing two miles west of Mursa Matura, and he made an unsuccessful forced landing and the aircraft burst into flames. The pilot was badly burned and he was conveyed to the Army Field Ambulance Station. Well, once Dahl had recovered from his injuries and returned to his squadron, he can then be found in a number of entries for 1941, as uh, number 80 squadron aided the Greeks in their fight with the Italians. In his book called Going Solo, Roald Dahl refers to the Battle of Athens in uh, April 1941. And this dogfight over the Greek capital city, in which he flew a, a Hawker Hurricane, is also recorded in the daily entry for the squadron on the uh, 20th of April 1941. It says, In the afternoon, the greatest combat in the epic Battle of Athens, when 15 Hurricanes, 9 of number 80 squadron and 6 of 30, number 33 squadron, took on 90 German fighters and bombers and was fought with great determination shown always by pilots of the Royal Air Force. In spite of the fact that the enemy was superior in numbers, the 15 Hurricanes destroyed no less than 15 of the enemy. Pilot Officer Dahl's name then occurs quite frequently in the records of the daily operations of this squadron. If we look for another example, uh, where action took place. If we look for the month of June 1941, we can see that early in the morning of the 8th of June, Roald Dahl took off at 0515 with three other pilots to carry out the RAF's attack on the Rayak aerodrome. Now, it was a base that was under Vichy French control and the air uh, the airfield was in Lebanon. Um, um, as it was under Vichy French control, it was therefore allied to Nazi Germany. The orb states that Dahl and his fellow pilots left three planes on fire, and that must have been a very nasty early morning wake up call for the enemy. Later that morning, he was back up in the air again on a search mission when he located an aircraft in the sea and directed a naval launch towards it. The afternoon saw him on a protective patrol where, with another pilot, he attacked an enemy aircraft that was last seen with its engine on fire. The orb also tells us the type of aircraft that they shot at. It was a Putty 63, and a little bit of research tells us that this was a twin-engined French plane often used at the time by the Air Force of Vichy France. On many days, however, the orbs report no enemy aircraft are seen. So, in the middle of the same month of June, while the squadron was on fleet protective patrol, they did intercept nine Ju-88s that were attacking the fleet. Dahl and his comrades were responsible for shooting down one of the Ju-88s 
they made another one forced land in Syria and a third one into the Sea of Cyprus. Now, taking off research further by using other records on the genealogist, you see, so far I've been concentrating on the Air 27 operations record books. But now I'm going to talk about expanding from the orbs to find the pilots in some of the other records on the genealogist. And for that, we're going to use a case study of a, a pilot, and he's uh, Paddy Furnican, uh, who was a Spitfire pilot. Paddy Furnican was an Irishman who'd been born in Dublin in October 1920, though he had moved to England with his parents in 1936. His mother was English, uh, originally from Leicester, but his father was Irish and had actually fought against the British in the 1916 Easter Rising. Paddy was his nickname and it was given to him by the pilots in the RAF. His real names were equally as Irish as his nickname and they were Brendan, Eamon, Fergus, Finnegan. As he grew up he wanted to fly so he applied to join the RAF and in August 1938 he was accepted for flight training as a pilot. He'd left school in England with fairly decent qualifications and originally went to work in an office as an accountant. Uh, but this job he was said to have loathed. In 1937, the RAF had just started to offer short service commissions to people who met academic standards um, without any reference to their social background whatsoever. And the RAF were offering a four-year term as a junior rank on squadron service with flying lessons, and then a period of six years on the reserve list, which all in all was an excellent proposition for a 17-year-old man who just wanted to fly. Now, what is endearing about this is that for someone who would go on to become a flying ace and to be promoted to quite a high rank, he was um, he, he had a very shaky start to his flying career in the RAF. Brendan Furnican crash landed on one occasion during his training. He also nearly flew into an airfield boundary hedge while on another occasion landing his aircraft saw him burst a tyre on approach. Eventually, however, he seemed to get the hang of things and he completed his flight training and in June to July 1940 he began conversion training to fly the Supermarine Spitfire. On the 13th of July, the new fighter pilot was posted to number 65 squadron at RAF Hornchurch and thus began a short but illustrious war service. So, the first record we're going to use is Air Force lists. If we turn to the uh, military section of records on the genealogist and then uh, put in his name and look for Air Force lists, we begin by selecting the RAF list for December 1938, where we come across Brendan Furnican as an acting pilot officer in the general list. This gives us his posting date of the 29th of October in that year. By then searching for him in the alphabetical index of names section of the same edition, we can see that he officially attained the rank um, a few days earlier, with the Air Force list noting his seniority ran from the 20th of October 1938. Looking at later Air Force lists, we can see that in the January 1942 edition that he really had now established himself as a top pilot because he now supports the designation of DSO and DFC for Distinguished Service Order and Distinguished Flying Cross. Uh, so this is now written after his name. In the middle of the year 1942, he would become a wing commander. And so now 
Wing Commander Brenda Naaman Fergus Finnegan, DSO, DFC and two bars, was reputedly the youngest man to hold that rank in the RAF. But sadly, by the middle of July of that very same year, he'd been reported missing. And so he does not appear in the next year's Air Force lists. It was the 15th of July 1942 that Wing Commander Fernican took off with his flight for a mission over France and his Spitfire was damaged by ground fire and so he attempted to fly back to England across the English Channel but he was forced to ditch into the sea and subsequently vanished. To find out more if we turn to the operations record books for his squadron at the time, we'll see that uh, the entry for the 15th of July for number 81 squadron, and we get from it an inkling of how the loss affected his colleagues. It says, we suffered a heavy loss. Wing Commander B. Fernican's machine was hit, landing on sea about 10 miles west of the French coast. His machine sank immediately and no further trace was seen of him. It is surmised he may have been stunned on impact with the water. He will be greatly missed by number 81 squadron, with whom he was very popular, spending a considerable time at our dispersals. It is a very heavy blow to lose so brilliant a fighter pilot at the age of 21. So that just tells you what his comrades were thinking. The next day, on the 16th of July, the entry simply reads, Weather poor. Some flying training during the day. The squadron appear very depressed over the death of Wing Commander B. Fernican. Now, there's a set of records that are very often overlooked by family history researchers, and those are for the General Register Office, the GRO, World War II death records. Uh, they're very similar to the regular GRO BMD index records that we all have used. But in this case, they list soldiers, sailors and airmen killed in the Second World War. In the case of RAF deaths, we're given the rank, the service number and the squadron as well as the volume and the page number required for ordering the certificate from the GRO. So here we can see the entry for Brendan Fernican in the um, World War II death index that can be found on the genealogist. War memorials are another interesting record set to use. Paddy Fernican has no grave, but he is commemorated on the Air Force's memorial to the missing of World War II. This memorial is near Egham in Surrey, and it's dedicated to some 20,456 men and women from the Air Forces of the British Empire who were lost in air and other operations during World War II. That particular memorial is one of many that can be found on the genealogist from uh, Britain and across the world. And if we do a bit more of a search for our uh, Spitfire pilot, we find uh, results for him in the uh, Battle of Britain Memorial at Capel La Fern in Kent, as well as the Battle of Britain Memorial on the Victoria Embankment in Westminster. Fernican's wartime tally credits him with 28 aerial victories, five probably destroyed, six shared destroyed, one shared probable victory and eight damaged. Now, some people have even said that this young Irish wing commander's total victory count could even be as high as 32 victories. So he was uh, an outstanding pilot. And when we think about the shaky start he had 
at the beginning of his flying career. Uh, it just shows that by the age of 21, this young man had really taken to the skies and was able to carry out missions for his, uh, his country, um, his adopted country, perhaps, as he was born in Dublin. But uh, that's why the orbs are such uh, wonderfully interesting and useful, informative records. So if we want to get an idea of what he and other countless other pilots were looking out for every time that they went up in the, to the air in those times, there is something else on the genealogist that we can turn to. It's a contemporary resource that's been made available within the reference book section. And it's the Aircraft Recognition Book that was originally published by the aeroplane from uh, the year 1939. And in it, we, we see um, silhouettes of enemy aircraft and photographs as well. So with Air Force lists, operations, record books, war death records and war memorials, Tracing an ancestor who fought in the Air Force using the genealogist's records can be a very enlightening uh, uh, research topic. It can make you very proud of the sacrifice that these individuals made, but also a little sad at how their lives were cut short so early. In this talk, we've seen how by using these official RAF operations record books, the Air 27 records, we're immediately able to see just what action the members of the Royal Air Force did on a day-to-day -day basis. The orbs also cover some Dominion and Allied Air Force squadrons that were under British command. When it's someone we recognise, such as a family member or a famous person, finding them mentioned in these journal-like records gives us such an amazingly valuable bit of information to add to our research and perhaps just understand a little of what they had experienced. Thank you very much for watching this short video and I wish you luck in your family history research. I'm Nick Thorne from the FamilyHistoryResearcher.com and I'm the writer of the Nosy Genealogist blog. <laughs>